of our house are cedar, our rafters are pine. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. As a lily among brambles, so I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Sustain me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am sick with love. His left hand is under my head. His right hand embraces me. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. So we're so grateful for that um, original compositions, just setting the whole scene for us in the Song of Songs. I wonder if you uh, knew this or not, but from the time of the early church fathers and then on through the Middle Ages, the Song of Songs was far and away one of the most popular books in the church. It was a book uh, as much or more than any other book in the Bible that pastors were preaching about, that scholars were commenting on. Why do you think that was? Well, maybe because it's about sex, if that's what you're thinking, and that might be right. But I wonder if something deeper is also at work, that we were made to be lovers, and that this book is intended to awaken a desire for intimacy and this is what people were drawn to, that there's a, a, an awakening of love and affection that really ultimately can only be satisfied by a personal relationship with the living God. This is why Christians have loved this book over the centuries and why we need to read it today. It occurs to me that spiritually speaking, many of us live as if we were single most of the time rather than married. You see, once you're married, you always have to give some consideration to the other person. You have to coordinate schedules, think about things that you're going to do together and how they fit together. But if you're single, you have so much more control over your time, your money, your decisions in life, both big and small. And unfortunately, that's the way many of us operate spiritually. Occasionally, we remember that we are betrothed to Jesus Christ, the bridegroom of heaven. But much of the time, we're too busy with our own agenda to make much time for Jesus. It's a little bit like that guy or that girl on your floor who tells you they're too busy with their studies to have a girlfriend or boyfriend. There's somebody like that on most floors, I think. <laughs> Jesus is crying out to us for a closer connection. When St. Augustine finally realized this, he lamented all of the time that he had wasted by living for himself. You probably know the quotation, late have I loved you, beauty so ancient and new. Late have I loved you. You see, faith in Christ came later for Augustine, but it didn't come too late. 
And as he looked back, he realized that Jesus had been pursuing, pursuing him all along and that this was the love that he had been waiting for all his life. You called, you shouted, you broke through my deafness, you banished my blindness, you lavished your fragrance, and now I pant for you, I tasted you, and I hunger and thirst. It's a kind of language Augustine may well have been drawing from the imagery of the Song of Solomon. I wonder, can you relate even a little bit to Augustine's spiritual passion? Part of my reason for asking is because I believe that a desire for loving intimacy with Jesus Christ is one of the best indicators of our overall spiritual health. And if our love is growing a little bit cold, the Song of Songs is here to help teaching us, yes, a lot about love on a human level, but also revealing a deeper hunger for the love of God, which is only satisfied in the beautiful person of Jesus Christ. Now, when last we left our two young lovers, the fragrance of their affection lingered in the air like the memory of a stolen kiss. The woman was imagining her beloved catching the scent of her sweet perfume, and then she imagined holding him close like a bouquet of flowers clutched close to her heart. And then suddenly, this brings us to the scripture that has been presented to us this morning, they are standing together face to face and speaking words of love. Their romance is progressing really the only way that a romance can through intimate conversation in which they explicitly declare their affection for one another. First, the man speaks, and we know this from the gender pronouns. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. He, he tells her how beautiful she is, and then he says it again. You know, some guys think they need to be clever, but simply telling a woman that she is beautiful and then saying it again, that can go a very long way. Then he gazes into her eyes and draws a comparison to the natural world. Her eyes are pure and beautiful like two doves. And apparently this woman's eyes really were the window to her soul because she looked back at him and responded with her own terms of endearment. Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. In effect, we are being allowed to eavesdrop on this conversation between these two lovers. It reminds me a little bit of the video I saw at a rehearsal dinner before the wedding of two Wheaton alums that I was asked to perform a few years ago. And the groom's roommates had interviewed him on a GoPro the night before he went over to ask this woman out for a date for the very first time. They, they kind of had a feeling, this is going to be the one. And so they were, uh, they interviewed him about what he was going to say and all that. And then they, uh, they hid, hid in the bushes outside uh, the lobby of the dorm <laughs> and filmed all of this. And their comments were hilarious, especially when they spoke directly to the couple's children and said, hey, we're doing, we, don't, you, we know you're not born yet, but this is for you. We're doing this for you guys. <laughs> the, only, the only problem with it was that they were too far away to hear the actual conversation, but we don't have that problem here. The Song of Songs takes us right in close, and there's a lot for us to learn from this dialogue. Surely we learn the God-given power of mutual attraction. Chemistry is crucial to any romance. And to recognize this is not unspiritual, it's simply recognizing the way that God made us. For a relationship to grow in the direction of godly marriage, a man and a woman must see what is beautiful in one another, both outwardly and inwardly. Now, that beauty doesn't have to measure up to the perhaps unreasonable standards of a culture. In fact, no one else has to see that beauty at all. It's simply important that they do, and they don't have to see it at the beginning either. In fact, sometimes uh, this kind of connection can even come as an answer to prayer. I've known this in pastoral ministry. Lord, 
A man might say, I see the possibility for a relationship here. Give me the eyes to see her true beauty. But in the end, one way or another, physical attraction and sexual desire are essential to a healthy marriage. We also learn how important it is for lovers to declare their affections. I remember uh, going into my father's office when I was a freshman and to get the first and maybe the only romantic advice I ever uh, asked for from my father. I had, uh, I had fallen hard for Lisa Maxwell, but she wasn't quite thinking that way about me at all. So I was asking for help and he said, well, do you love her? And I said, a moment later, yeah, I, I think I do. And he said, well, you better tell her. And I kind of waited for more. But fortunately, that was all the advice I needed. The man in the Song of Songs had taken that kind of advice to heart. All the way through this song, he repeatedly calls this woman his love, his darling, his sweetheart. And she needs to hear that because she is vulnerable to an old insecurity. Maybe you remember this from last time. Sometimes she finds it hard to believe that she is beautiful. I think we actually catch a hint of this at the beginning of chapter 2 when she compares herself to a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. That, that poetry may lead you to think that she's confident about her appearance, but these plants are simply common wildflowers, uh, beautiful in their own way, but also very common. Actually, the woman is being somewhat self-deprecating. I was trying to think of a contemporary comparison. Maybe this comes a little bit close. I am a dandelion in the outfield. Uh, there's a kind of beauty there, but it's not really designed to impress people. <laughs> Her beloved's response is perfect. It's witty. It's amusing in a way. It's deeply affirming. He says, as a lily among the brambles, so is my love, there he goes again, among the young women. He starts where she is. You call yourself a wildflower? Okay, I can go along with that. But compared to everyone else, you're like a rare wildflower that someone sees in, in a field of common weeds. It's kind of like our English expression, you're a rose between two thorns. A man sees the true beauty in the woman he loves, the unique and God-given beauty that only she possesses, and he praises her for it. The woman sees his beauty too, but she is looking for more. Notice the transition she makes in verses 16 and 17. First, she repeats his words back to him nearly, nearly verbatim. Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved. She, she turns it right back to him. But then she goes on to describe already the kind of home she hopes they can make together. She's talking in verse 17 about the beams and rafters of their house. And I know at this point, some guys are probably thinking, you know, this is kind of what's wrong with a lot of young women. You ask them out for a date and they start planning what kind of house you're going to live in. <laughs> I mean, couldn't we agree on it as a campus that a date is just a date, not a marriage proposal? But I also want you to see this. I don't want you to miss the significance of this woman's desire. Her heart is longing for a home. And so she imagines the house that they might build together, a beautiful house with strong beams. And really, it is the deep desire of every person's heart, whether we know it or not. We were made for home. And we were made for a permanent home with the Father's only Son, the Bridegroom, Jesus Christ, who has made a solemn vow and joyful promise that he will go and prepare a place for us in his Father's mansions. That's the deep desire of the human heart. And we're reminded of that hope when a woman like this dreams about making a home with the man she loves. This reminded me a little bit of the dynamic you see on some of those television shows where couples are trying to find a new house. And most of the time, they, the man and the woman have very different priorities. They end up disagreeing about which house they like the best. But when it comes time for the final decision, the husband almost always defers. Why is that? 
Maybe for this reason, because the woman's desire to make a home runs deep. It's certainly true of the woman here in the Song of Songs. Her heart is looking for a home. And her beloved wisely recognizes this and is making within their relationship a safe space for their relationship to grow. He's not getting ahead of himself the way she is perhaps tempted to do. But notice the way that this woman praises him for the things that he is doing in their relationship. There's a sense of protection here which comes without any kind of patronizing effect. But here's the praise she gives. As an apple among the trees of the forest, so is my beloved among the young men. With great delight I sat in his shadow. His fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. These verses tell us what this woman is looking for, maybe what most women are looking for in a man. We already know that she thinks he's good looking, but now she uses comparisons to describe some of his other attributes. He's like an apple tree. An apple tree, particularly in the desert, would be an attractive thing. Strong, offering protective shade in the heat of the day. And remember, this, this woman grew up in the country. She had grown up doing heavy labor under the hot sun. And best of all, apple trees produce, of course, apples, juicy and delicious, an image of natural beauty expressing a desire for a fruitful relationship. Here's another Comparison: The love of this man is like a banner. It's uh, an image that comes from the army where a banner is a military standard. You might, might imagine a, a pennant flying over the pavilion of a medieval knight or the kinds of flags that uh, soldiers carry to the battlefield in the Civil War to identify their units. It's an image of power and authority and identity. In a way, I suppose, this woman is saying that, that her beloved's flag has captured her heart. If you wanted a kind of contemporary analogy, maybe it's a little bit like this. It's like a girl wearing her boyfriend's football jersey. There's a strong sense of identification. But what this young woman, this beautiful bride, wants to celebrate most of all is her beloved's Affection, that's what this banner is all about. It's a banner of love. And you get a picture of their relationship in verse 6. They're, they're locked in a tender embrace. His left hand is under her head. His right arm is wrapped around her shoulder. If you could bring this couple into the 21st century, you can almost see them sitting close together on the couch watching something from Netflix. That's the kind of scene that we're given here. The woman in this passage is looking for loving protection, and when she finds it, she celebrates it. Now, the last time we were together in the Song of Songs, I gave some strong exhortations to the men on this campus about how to speak to and about women. Maybe some of you remember those. Some of what I said also applied to women. I didn't say that explicitly. I somewhat figured that many would be able to take that to heart in any case. But here, in the example of the lover in the Song of Songs, you have something more explicit as an application for women, knowing what to affirm in the men that you love. And it, it wouldn't apply just to romantic relationships either. But here you find the Bible striking an amazing balance between strength and gentleness, between protection and affection as manly quality, something a man should aspire to, but also something that uh, calls for a woman's encouragement. This is one of the ways that a man enters into the calling that God has for him and the attributes God has for him. It is by the affirmation of women who care for him. Now, up until this point, there's been a clear progression. I don't think we've had a DTR yet, but I think we can pretty much tell where this relationship is going. You know, the song started with a woman that wanted to be kissed right on the lips, and then before she knew it, she was talking to this man that she loved, and then they started talking a little bit more, then gazing into one another's eyes, then they're starting to embrace. I think we can all see where this is going. And isn't it, therefore, all the more striking 
that it's right at this point in the romance we get a warning so serious it comes with a solemn oath. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Now, I realize this is not the way people usually talk. But remember, this is a song, and that's simply poetry set to music, and poetry uses imagery to communicate, and the image here is of a gazelle or of a female deer. You get a lot of comparisons like that in the Song of Songs. The writer often expresses the beauty of the human body, and I think in a way protects the, the mystery of sexual intimacy by speaking figuratively rather than literally. Deer and gazelles are beautiful animals. They're also very fertile. So in the ancient world, they were often associated with lovemaking. Frankly, by the time we get to chapter 2, verse 7, this young woman is thinking about sex. But believe it or not, she is also thinking about God, which is what we ought to have in mind whenever we are thinking about sex. Now, I say she's thinking about God because the sounds of these Hebrew words for gazelles and for does of the field are very close to the divine names, the Lord of hosts and God Almighty. I don't think anyone reading this or hearing this in a Hebrew culture would have missed the connection. There's a kind of double meaning here. Yes, the gazelles and does of the field, but also God Almighty, the Lord of hosts. She is saying something so important that at this point in the song, she wants to call God himself as her witness. So what is it that she wants to say? Well, she's speaking to the daughters of Jerusalem, her bridesmaids, so to speak, and she wants to give them some advice. And it goes something like this. Girlfriend, you do not want to get this hungry for a man until the time is right. <laughs> That's what she's saying. Now, part of this point here of awakening, it's, you know, sexual desire is like a sleeping lion. There are a lot of times it is better left alone. And somehow it seems significant to me that the person giving us this advice is young and beautiful and anticipating her wedding night. You know, you get similar advice to this in, uh, the, in the Proverbs where Solomon speaks to his son. It's kind of what you expect a father to say, say to a son. But here is a bridesmaid on, uh, here is a bride on the eve of her wedding. And she wants to say something very serious to her friends and to us. She is not just saying no, she is saying yes, but she is saying yes with the right person at the right time. This is God's wisdom for us from the Song of Songs. Sexual intimacy is one of the most powerful gifts that God ever created, which of course means that it is also very dangerous, something to be careful with. And this woman wants us to know that true love really does wait and so she tells us not to awaken these things until the time is right. And what is the right time? The right time for sexual intimacy, of course, is when a man and a woman get married. That is the moral context for sex. And I think also in the Bible, you might put it this way, it is also the hermeneutical context for sex. The Bible interprets everything pertaining to sexual relations from within the context of marriage. Now, it'd be hard for me to think of something more countercultural right now than to tell people, particularly young people, not to awaken their desires. This is a culture that believes every desire should be satisfied. It's always trying to awaken our desire, and particularly sexual desire. Think of all of those enticing advertisements, all of those pornographic images. Every one of them a violation of the holy principle that sexual desire should not be stirred up at the wrong time. This is one of those times when God tells us that he doesn't want us to have something that a lot of times, frankly, we want. 
God doesn't always do that, but he does do it sometimes. And it always brings some degree of suffering, which is why it's important to recognize that he's not saying what he says about sex here because he wants to get in the way of our pleasure. It's just the opposite of that. His wisdom is always for us. It's never against us. And in this case, he doesn't want us to settle for small pleasures that will get in the way of greater satisfaction such as might come if God calls us to it in a marriage that will last, and most of all comes in the deep joy of having a close relationship with him, whether we are married or single. I think the reason God tells us not to awaken sexual desire is fairly simple. It's that when we share sexual intimacy with the wrong person at the wrong time, or when we gratify sexual desire all by ourselves, it always destroys relationships. It gets in the way of true love and intimacy. I sometimes compare sex to super glue. It's designed to form a lifetime bond between a husband and wife that make promises to one another. But when you use it in all the wrong ways, it ends up more like a sticky note that you've pressed down and pulled up a few dozen times. It loses its power to unite. And that is why even when your body says yes and your culture says yes, the Holy Spirit is saying, not now or not yet, or maybe no, this is not the gift that I have for you. What a huge test this is for us. It's a choice we all have to make, whether married or single, whether we desire the same sex or the opposite sex. It's the question, will we let our desires take control or will we honor God with our bodies? And what's really at stake is our relationship to Jesus. Sex is never disconnected from the rest of spiritual life. In fact, I think it's as closely connected to the soul as anything else in the world. And if we do not hear God's call to purity, the gospel will not penetrate that area of life. We don't hear the call to purity, we just ignore it. And so we go our own way without coming back to God in repentance for all of our failures. But the more we pursue sexual purity, the more passion there will be in our relationship with Jesus. And that is true at whatever point you pursue sexual purity. Uh, even if you've gone in the wrong direction sexually in all kinds of ways, the moment that you choose to pr pursue sexual purity, that is a moment when there is an opportunity for your passion for Jesus to grow. I like the way Elizabeth Elliot thought about this issue. She said, when obedience to God contradicts what I think will give me pleasure, let me ask myself this question, do I love him? Let me say that again. When obedience to God contradicts what I think will give me pleasure, let me ask myself if I really do love Jesus. This book of the Song of Songs is for lovers. It's not just in human relationships, but also in our relationship to God. That's the deep mystery this book is pointing us towards. And the passion that we see in this lover and this beloved, that this passion that they are protecting with their purity, it calls us to fall deeper in love with Jesus to draw the analogy, not as a kind of allegory, but simply as an analogy. He's the apple tree of salvation. He's the source of rest and refreshment. His banner over us is love. It's a, it's a banner that be bears the emblem of the cross where he died for our sins, including all of our sexual sins. Jesus is inviting us into his banqueting house. Indeed, he'll do it tonight at all school communion where bread and wine will be food for your soul. And what Jesus wants in return for that, that grace, is all of our love and all of ourselves, including that part of self which is sexual. And that's why the people of God have turned to this book for help again and again over the centuries. We know that Jesus is calling us to a deeper love. And let's come to him as we close with the prayer that Augustine once prayed. Lord, we cannot measure our love to know how much it falls short 
But let our souls hasten to your embrace and never be turned away until we are hidden in the secret shelter of your presence. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.